I am a Japanese American. I have the blessing of dual heritages. I have the heritage of Japan brought by my uh, grandparents who sailed from right here, uh, the port of Yokohama to America, bringing with them values that we call shimbo, of gamang, of gambaru. I also have my American heritage of democracy. Uh, one of our great presidents, Abraham Lincoln, said that our nation was conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Our American ideals are noble ideals, ideals of rule of law, of equal justice under the law, and of due process. But we Japanese Americans also know, know the fragility of our democracy. As shining as those ideals are, they are dependent on people who give meaning to those words, people who care about what we and what democracy stands for. On December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor was bombed. It was a destructive, horrific bombing. Over 2,400 people were killed. 20 major ships were sunk. Eight of them were great battleships. Over 300 aircrafts were destroyed. It was a devastating bombing. The terror of that bombing swept across the Pacific to the west coast of North Amer America and then rolled on across the continent to the Atlantic coast. The nation was terrorized. Part of the terror was that in America itself were people who looked just like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. That was us, Japanese Americans. Overnight, we were looked at with suspicion and fear and outright uh, hatred simply because of the way we look. Japanese Americans walking on the sidewalk were yelled at, spat at, and called ugly racist names. Our homes, our businesses, and even my father's car was graffitied. The ugly racist word Jap, J-A-P, was painted on our car. The real terror was, it, the, this kind of uh, racism was not limited to just the ignorant racist people. Our government officials, elected officials, were swept up in that same racist terror. And they, the government came down with a curfew on Japanese Americans. We had to be home by 8 p.m. at night and stay home until 6 a.m. in the morning. The next morning, when we went to the bank to make a deposit or a withdrawal, we discovered that our bank accounts were frozen. Our savings were taken. Some families' entire life savings was taken by the government. On February 19th, 1942, the President of the United States, United States was swept up in the same hysteria and he signed Executive Order 9066, which ordered all Japanese Americans on the West Coast, from the Canadian border to the Mexican border, to be summarily rounded up and imprisoned in 10 barbed wire prison camps in some of the most desolate God forbid, uh, forbidden places in the United States. There were 10 camps altogether. There were two 
on the blistering hot desert of Arizona, there were two in the sweltering swamps of southern Arkansas, the farthest eastern of, of the camps. There were camps in the windswept high plains of, uh, of uh, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and uh, two of the most desolate places in California. Our family lived in a two-bedroom house on Garnet Street in Los Angeles. I was five years old. My brother was a year older, four years old. Our baby sister was an infant. And I will never be, be, be able to forget that terrifying morning when my brother and I were ordered to wait in the living room while, while our parents did some packing in their bedroom. We were just gazing out at the neighborhood, and suddenly we saw two soldiers marching up our driveway. They carried rifles with shiny bayonets on them. They stomped up the front porch and with their fists began banging on the door. Henry and I were terrified. We were ordered out of our home with only what we could carry. Our baby sister was obviously uh, something, <laughs> someone that was carried. We were taken by bus to a nearby horse race track where we were unloaded, herded over to the stable area, and each family was assigned a horse stall, still pungent with the stink of horse manure. For my parents, it was a degrading, a humiliating experience to take their three children into a smelly horse stall with insects crawling around on the ground and flies buzzing through the air. They told us this was only a temporary housing while the camps were being built in the various uh, desolate places. Uh, and after about four months, we were told that we would be moved to our, in, uh, our prison camps. We were packed into trains with armed soldiers at both ends of each car. I, uh, my father told us we were going for a long vacation in the country. To me, it was exciting a vacation in the country, and a train ride. I'd never had either. Both Henry and I were excited, but we couldn't understand why all the grown-ups looked so glum, and some of the ladies were crying. It was a long journey of three days and two nights through the American desert, and finally, on the third day, the scenery turned green and lush. It was the swamps of Arkansas. And by afternoon, we had reached our destination, a camp called Rower. The train slowed down, and we found that the camp was uh, built parallel to the railroad tra track. We rolled alongside the barbed wire fence, and we saw uh, masses of Japanese Americans staring uh, up at us arriving. And behind them, I saw rows and rows and rows of black tar paper barracks, all arranged in military order, with five, blo uh, five barracks on each side in the middle uh, of each block. And in the middle was uh, a latrine, a laundry room, and uh, uh, um, that was a, a men's, men's latrine, woman's latrine, and a laundry room. And there was one barrack set aside as a common mess hall. I began school there in a black tar paper barrack. On the first day, the teacher said that she's going to teach us the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag. Obviously, that was the American flag at the front of the classroom. 
the pledge included the words, with liberty and justice for all. Every morning, I pledged allegiance to the, the flag of the United States of America with the words, with liberty and justice for all. But right outside my schoolhouse window, I saw threatening barbed wire fences, tall barbed wire fence, tall sentry towers with armed soldiers glaring down at us. I was too young to understand that they did not stand for liberty or justice or freedom at all. A year into imprisonment at uh, Rohr, the government suddenly made a realization. They had a wartime manpower shortage, and here were all these young people, men and women, who could have been drafted, but they had categorized as enemy alien. They, they categorized all of us, even little me, my brother, and my baby sister, as enemy alien. It was absolutely and irrational. And in the, uh, in, the, in the middle of the war, they realized that there was a wartime manpower shortage in the military. Here were all these young people that they now wanted in the U.S. military. How to justify drafting enemy aliens into the United States Army? That was their uh, dilemma. Their solution was outrageous. It was to demand a loyalty questionnaire to be answered by everyone over the age of 17 in the uh, internment camps. The loyalty questionnaire was put together by people who were ignorant and thoughtless. In the chaos and confusion of wartime, many incompetents became lodged in the bureaucracy of the military and of the government. It was these incompetents that drafted the loyalty questionnaire. Embedded in the loyalty questionnaire were two questions that the government expected yes answers, one way or the other. Uh, yes, those that answered no were in danger. Question 27 simply asked, are you willing to serve in the U.S. military on combat duty wherever ordered? To fight in the war for the government that's imprisoning you and to com uh, co uh, uh, compound that, my parents were being asked to abandon their three very young children and bear arms to defend the country that's imprisoning their children. They uh, had, had a truthful and powerfully honest answer. They answered no to that question. Question 28, the next critically important question, asked, with one sentence, two conflicting ideas. That one sentence was, will you swear your loyalty to the United States of America and forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? It was a real dilemma. It didn't make sense. If you answered yes, meaning yes, I do swear my loyalty to the United States, you are also answering yes to the second part, which meant that you're forswearing loyalty to the Emperor of Japan when we didn't even have, Nisei's didn't have a loyalty to the uh, Emperor. But the wor word forswear means they assumed that we were, because we looked like this, we had a loyalty to the Emperor. So if you answered no, I don't have a loyalty to the, to the emperor. That no applied to the first part of the sa very same sentence, will you swear your loyalty to the United States? If he answered yes, meaning I do swear my loyalty to the United States, 
then that yes applied to the second part meant that you were confessing that you had been loyal to the emperor and now were prepared to forswear that. It was a, an absolute no-win question. You lost with a yes and you lost with a no. My parents again answered with two strong no's. And because of those two no answers, they were now recategorized as disloyals. And because of that uh, categorization of diso disloyal, we had to be moved to another, much harsher camp, the, probably the most uh, harsh of all the 10 camps, called Tule Lake in Northern California. It was a cold, windswept, uh, vegetation-less uh, uh, de uh, northern desert uh, uh, kind of area. And there, with those two no answers, they were put into the harshest of the camps. It had not just one barbed wire fence, but two more, three barbed wire fences. The sentry towers were equipped with machine guns pointed at us. I looked up and I can see, I can see the machine gun pointed up at me. And they had a half dozen tanks, six tanks patrolling the perimeter beyond the uh, uh, third barbed wire fence. This was an outrageously stupid and exacerbating uh, uh, overreaction by the United States government. Tanks that belong on a battlefield fighting a war, rolling around to intimidate and gold people who were already outraged and enraged by the outrageous reaction of the U.S. government. Going back to the uh, loyalty questionnaire, there were young people who hated being in prison. They were willing to do anything to get away from imprisonment. And so they bit the bullet, swallowed the ugly taste of compromise, and they answered yes to those stupid, hateful questions. And because of those two yeses, they were drafted into the U uh, United States military. The women were put into the WACs, the Women's Army Corps. The men were put into a segregated, all Japanese American unit called the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Segregation upon uh, 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 imprisonment, upon in, in, impoverishment, one outrage after another outrage after another outrage. The men of the 442nd were sent to fight on the battlefields of Europe. They were used like cannon fodder. They were sent into the most dangerous battles, some of them uh, stalemated for months on end. They were they, but they plunged in determined to demonstrate their strength, their courage, and who they are. They went in and fought. The first wave of Japanese Americans went with incredible courage, and some fought with amazing heroism, and they were gunned down. And the next wave came, and they fought equally co courageously, and they were gunned down, and the next, and the next, and the next. The men of the 442nd sustained the highest combat uh, uh, casualty rate of any other unit in the American military force. It was a costly war for everyone. Back in Tule Lake, uh, my mother's uh, family ca uh, came from Hiroshima. There was a rumor that spread throughout the camp that a horrific, devastating bomb was dropped first on Hiroshima and then on Nagasaki. We knew nothing of that. It was only rumors whispered from one person to another. We were in a prison camp. We had no newspapers, no radio, no access to the outside world. 
it was only whispered rumors, and that made the pain even more anguishing. My mother had relatives in Hiroshima. We heard horrifying stories that we didn't want to believe, and yet it was unthinkable. A bomb that devastates on that scale had never been experienced by anyone, any city, any people on earth, and yet there was no details. The war ended and the men of the 442nd came back to the United States as celebrated heroes. They were welcomed back on the White House lawn by President Harry Truman, who said to them, you fought not only the enemy, but prejudice, and you won. They came back as heroes, celebrated heroes. The people of the other camps, including the horrific camp at Tule Lake, were released. The gates were wide open, and the war was over. But the struggle was not over for Japanese Americans, whether you were soldiers coming back or people who uh, were impoverished getting out of all the camps. The war was over, and we all struggled to get back on our feet. And as I was growing up as a teenager, I asked my father many, many questions about the camps. My father was someone who understood both the strength and the nobility and the fragility of American democracy. He educated all three of us, my brother and my sister and, and myself, that our democracy is a participatory democracy. The ideals are good, but if the good people who believe in the ideals aren't involved in the democratic process, then the ideals mean nothing. We have to be actively en engaged in democracy. And he took me to a presidential uh, a campaign, Adlai Stevenson for president, and we volunteered in that service. My father introduced me to electoral politics, and I understood what American democracy meant. We have to infuse meaning into those idealistic words. As I became active in the political process, I understood that we determine our own uh, condition in a democracy. We were impoverished, we were discriminated against, our society was broken by uh, the government. And so we have to be involved in the project to set democracy straight. And as a young man, I became an activist in the political arena. And uh, in the 1970s, we began a movement to get an apology for the unjust imprisonment and the impoverishment of uh, our incarceration. And so with an apology, we were campaigning for redress, uh, a redress for damage done. So as we began that, that uh, grassroots campaign, something undreamed of when we were behind barbed wire fences had happened in Washington, D.C. Japanese Americans were in the halls of Congress as elected officials. There were three Japanese Americans in the lower house, the House of Representatives, and in the upper house, the U.S. Senate, we had two Japanese American senators. Both were from Hawaii. Both were veterans of the 442nd. In fact, one had a loose right sleeve. He had lost his red, uh, right arm on a bloody battlefield in Italy, uh, Italy. His name was Senator Daniel Inoue. With the leadership from the uh, Japanese American uh, uh, Americans in Congress and with the uh, grassroots support from the community, 
we built a campaign for an apology and redress. Congress organized a commission to gather information on the internment. And uh, in uh, uh, eight, 1981, they held hearings from, uh, the, uh, from the people, uh, Japanese Americans as well as uh, any other Americans who had a comment to make on the internment. I was one of 700 people that testified at that uh, Congressional Commission. I said to the Commissioner, I am an American and I ca care about my country as much as you, the Commissioners, do. You are Americans as I am an American and we cherish the ideals of our American democracy. I said I feel that America today is now honest enough and confident enough to recognize a mistake it has made. It is also strong enough to protect the integrity of American ideals. And so I urge you all, fellow commissioners, as Americans, to approve a apology and a restitution for, to, for Japanese Americans for the unjust incarceration. In 1984, the co commission returned with a report that went to the White House. The commission report found that the internment of Japanese Americans was due to three causes. One was war hysteria, two, racial prejudice, and three, the failure of political leadership. This report went to the pre uh, President of the United States. The President received that, and in 1988, President Ronald Reagan, formally on behalf of the people of the United States, apologized for the internment of Japanese Americans, and he signed the Civil Liberties Act, which authorized the payment of $20,000 to every survivor who was still alive at the time of the signing of the Civil Liberties Act. I am both of Japanese heritage and American heritage. My Japanese heritage of Shimbo, Gamang, and Gambaru combined with my steady, steadfast belief in government by law and e e uh, equal justice under the law. Both of my heritages what is what defines me and Japanese Americans who engaged in the process of making our country a better country. We are proud Japanese Americans. Domo arigatou gozaimasu.